Happy Valentine's Day! Matt, will you be my Valentine? Yes, I'll be your Valentine. Here, take this card. Take it. Take it. It's not working! In my last video, I asked you guys to leave some comments and ideas regarding Aspies in romantic relationships. So, I'm gonna go back to that video and take a look at some of those. I don't want to look at you, whatever you are. Uh, your fiance. You're creepy. <laughs> Speaking of creepy, one of the questions that we had was about how to not be creepy or to come across as creepy to people. Let me read that. Uh, How's an Aspie express that he fancies someone without creeping them out or without coming across insecure? I, um, I will answer that when I figure that out. Yeah, when I first met Matt, um, he kind of creeped me out. <laughs> I mean, I'm someone who gets creeped out kind of easily, but I guess um, the thing that specifically creeped me out was the fact that he seemed overly friendly, which sounds kind of weird because, you know, you should be friendly to make people like you, but I think there's kind of a limit to it. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't know how to give specifics on that, because, you know, everyone's kind of got different levels of friendliness. Um, and if you can't read other people, it's really hard to tell, you know, when the friendliness is too much, or when the creepiness is too much, whatever it is that's creeping them out. Um, to be honest, I would just go right out and, like, ask if anything you're saying or doing is bothering the other person. That's usually what I do, but then again, a lot of neurotypicals might not tell you out of politeness, so I don't know. What do you think, man? Well, I have no well, idea. Well, I agree with you with one minor segue. Uh, yeah. Don't go overboard on asking if something is creeping them out, because that in itself can creep people out. Or come across as insecure. If you're asking a bunch of questions like, am I too creepy? Am I too friendly? Am I too this? Am I doing this? Is this hurting you? Is... Yeah. So I think by finding sort of a balance of contributing to the conversation while also getting something from the other person kind of helps. Like if you're, um, you know, if you're pushing too much of your own stuff on the other person, that will seem creepy. If you take in too much of their stuff without providing anything in return, like talking about yourself or things that you like or um, things of that nature, then you might seem insecure. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Mark? I think so, yeah. <laughs> okay. I was going to say, uh, question number two from Mustafa is, uh, is it better to tell people straight away that you have Asperger's or should it be left until later? In my opinion, the times when you should tell people about your Asperger's is when it benefits you in some way. Like if you're going to a university or something and you need accommodations, it's good to probably tell them, hey, I have Asperger's and I might need a little help in these specific areas. And that's totally okay. Or like if you're going to be spending a lot of time with somebody, um, at least this is what I do. If I'm going to spend a lot of time with someone, I would usually tell them I have Asperger's because I can I can put on a you know normal mask for so long, and in cases where I'm just you know meeting people for an hour, a couple hours, I don't I don't need to tell them that. But if I'm going to be around them a lot, I need to tell them because if it if all of a sudden I have no energy, I'm drained, my Aspergersness comes out. I don't want them to think I'm crazy. What's the third part of uh, Mustafa's comment? Uh, what is the best way to help a fellow Aspie? I know someone who has Asperger's and I want to help her. And really, I think it depends on the person because no two Aspies are exactly the same. And it depends on what you're helping them with, I guess. Right. Like, I'm not, I'm not sure. Did he specify? Uh, no. What he meant, or? Nope, that's the question. Yeah, it's just kind of broad. Again, yeah, it really... I know a lot of people with Asperger's, like, we share commonalities, but everybody's different. So you kind of have to really just pay attention 
to her quirks and her needs and things that make her happy and things that make her upset and um, try to accommodate according to those things. So here's another comment from Treehopper721. Would it be better to date someone on the spectrum or could find someone not on the spectrum who would understand me? I'm an Aspie. That's a good question. Uh, again, depends on people, depends on your personality and the other person's personality. Um, how I see it, NTs and Aspies, it's like, it's like they're two different species, but within those species, each individual kind of has their own personality. So, because in the past, I've actually, I've, I've wanted to date this guy who was an Aspie, mostly because he was an Aspie. He was the only person that I knew who had Asperger's. And it turns out that we were not compatible at all. Um, so it's less to do with the um, SBNT thing and more to do with personality compatibility. I think it can definitely work out if you, let's say you're an Aspie and you meet an NT who understands you and understands Asperger's. That's really, really, really helpful. Um, it's like, you know, when the two species understand each other, of course it's going to go better. It just depends on... Compatibility, personality, good communication, all the things like that that you need for a good relationship. So, hi Muffin. Hi. Like, we're Aspies, and we're very compatible, right? Exactly. Uh, we come from two different cultures, but it works. It does work, and uh, a big part of that is we have really good communication. There was actually another comment on here that was asking specifically about us. Someone says, as Aspies, you two have several similarities, but with many differences as well. And something about how we're able to work through our differences. Um, like I said, it, for us, it was about really good communication and compatible personalities, for sure. Like, we can have differences without those and it might not work out that well like if we if we have things that are different about us but then fail to communicate i think it's less likely to work out i don't know i can't think of any i my brain is not working i'm not wording things right muffin <laughs> you're doing fine you're doing fine huh? <laughs> What's your answer to that question, Matt? Why do you think why do you think we work together so well if we have so many differences? Well I'm trying to figure out how to put it into words. I think a big part of it was just the amount of time that we've spent talking, you know, communicating. I think communication is the biggest thing. Um when we first met we talked literally every day we still do we still talk literally yeah. every day even though we're long distance but i think uh, there's another part of that um what was it er acceptance is one we yeah. accept the differences Ex yeah um we accept our differences for sure um it's not just you know it's just it's not just a, you know saying like i'll tolerate you you tolerate me it's more like no it's like you think this way and i respect that i think this way and you respect that so we're we're all good and um, part of that is also we don't take things personally between each other if like if matt disagrees with me on something i used to take it personally but now i don't it's like i just know that matt just has like a different opinion on something that doesn't mean that it's a personal attack on me um it's just something that we just talk through and as long as the emotions are down as long as the emotions are calm nobody's getting angry or upset about things they tend to work out really well along with the settling differences thing someone asked about if me and matt have shared interests and it's kind of interesting trying to find shared interests when you have a lot of things that are different but we do have things that we were already interested in like we both like you know lord of the rings and Lord of the Rings, what else do we like? Uh, well, there's fantasy games. 
number one. Video games. Yeah, lots of video games. Yeah. And I'll play just about anything. Um, uh, music. We have similar tastes. Yeah, similar tastes in music. Um, but a lot of the things that, like, in terms of the settling differences things, by trying to understand what's different about each other, it actually kind of helped us to get more interested in what the other person's interested in, even if we didn't, we weren't really into it in the first place. Like, one good example is, um, Matt really likes Vikings, and so he loves the TV show Vikings, and I was like, yeah, I've never seen it, not sure if I'd be interested in it. And then, um, he yeah, got me to start watching it, and now I like it, so sometimes on date night we'll sit down and watch Vikings. But is there anything that I got you interested in? Anything. Because <laughs> I don't think there's anything. I'm sure there's some. I'm just drawing a blank right now. I think because I'm more people-driven, maybe I've influenced your personality more so than your interests. That's it. You've, you've balanced me out. Out, I'm not so. He's more yeah. like. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Does that sound accurate? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of long distance relationships, uh, I got a comment from Broadway singer saying, "I'm in a long distance relationship with a guy, but I still feel alone. How can I keep it stable?" P.S. Also have Aspergers. Um. It's definitely not easy and it's not for everyone. Um, I know some people who have tried long distance and they've done everything they could, but it just didn't work out. Uh, you know, me and Matt are lucky because it does work out. Um, so what are some of the ways, Matt, that we kind of help keep the relationship alive even though we live a couple states away? Uh, well, we have date nights, for one. Uh, we will watch movies together. We'll have you know, we just set aside time just for us. Yeah. And it doesn't, I know it sounds kind of funny because we're not together in person. So like, how would we do all that stuff together? How would we have a date night? Well, that's why technology is just wonderful. Um, with Skype, we do screen sharing movies. We'd like stream movies while we're talking. Um, we also occasionally would use this, uh, it's a chat program called IMVU where you have like this little... 3D avatar version of you, and that kind of helps give us the illusion of, you know, we're standing in the same room even though it's just an online, you know, 3D chat thing. Uh, what are some other ways? Um, well, we talk literally every day. We do. <laughs> it's it's hard uh, sometimes because I, especially, mostly for me, it's not hard for you. It's hard for me because I'm an introvert and I'm like... And I'm also really ambitious. Like, I want to do all these other things. And the fact that Matt's not here means I can do these things, right? And it's like, no, the relationship is still active 24-7, even when you're apart. And I think with long distance, it's really easy to forget that because they're not there. Right. But uh, it's it's nice waking up and the first person you talk to is your significant other. Yes. I keep my phone next to my bed for that reason. So I can call Matt in the morning and be like... Good morning! I have morning breath and you can't smell it. <laughs> the internet has advantages. Yeah. Oh, one more thing about long distance. Don't rush it and wait until you've met with them in person to make any big life decisions revolving them. Like, uh, you know, if you want to marry them or move in with them, you have to know how they are in person. Because through the internet, it's not 100% accurate. It doesn't really tell you the whole story. Right. Uh, I actually made a whirlwind two-week trip to Illinois to meet Alyssa in person before we actually became a couple. Yes. <laughs> we, only were, we only knew each other for two weeks, technically, even though we've been talking online for a year. I got a couple comments about this, and this seems to be a common issue, is how to meet people to date. And I think it's really hard for anyone, because, um, like, when you're single, it's hard to figure out, like, you know, where do I look? Um, yeah. And another question that kind of ties into this that I'll bring up is, um, 
should you does it does it tend to work out if you're not actively looking for a relationship or should you actually be consciously looking and i think it's honestly a little bit of both um i don't think it should be your main focus in life for sure uh i i will i would like to add though is that uh when Alyssa found me on the internet she, she was actively looking <laughs> i was just kind of on facebook <laughs> i didn't take my own advice <laughs> I was saying that uh, a good place to find somebody that's on the spectrum would be Facebook. There's lots of different groups to connect with people on. For sure, that's where I met Matt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when I was actively looking. Um, I've actually on my, uh, my, I have a Facebook page for my YouTube channel. And on that page, there's this list of um, resources. And on that list, there are a whole bunch of links to different Facebook groups for people with Asperger's and there's there's groups with over like 20,000 people so when they say there's a lot of fish in the sea there's a lot of fish in the sea <laughs> so someone left some great advice on meeting people from Anna Radford go to events that have to do with your interests or even an Asperger's group uh, I agree with that um, especially because Aspies are very interest driven at least most of them are so if there's something that you're really into, like uh, anime or uh, I'm trying to think of other things, sports, just any any interest that you're into, if you can find any groups or clubs that have to do with that, whether they're online or in person, um, there's a greater chance of meeting somebody that you will like that way, rather than just kind of you know looking in a crowd of mixed people. And that's what the internet's for, too, is finding those kind of things. I'm sure if you do a search, you'll probably find some group somewhere that relates to your interests. So someone commented about this, and I know it's always a curiosity for a majority of people, is um, basically related to Aspies and sex. And I will tell you, people with Asperger's can and do have sex, and... I'm not sure if this is true, but I have noticed that it's sexuality is kind of different for most people on the spectrum versus typical people. Um, so I've noticed there seems to be more people who are LGBTQ and that and who are Aspies or who are asexual or who have really interesting <laughs> fetishes. I'm um, not saying that that's like not normal, but it's like I just seem to see a lot more of that in the Asperger's community. I don't uh, know. What do you What do you think? <laughs> um, another thing to add to that is another thing that I've noticed seems to be pretty common is uh, instances of uh, hyposexuality and hypersexuality. That's a good point. Uh, where people are either they have no desire or desire all the time yeah and uh, it's not so black and white either i mean they could have you know just less or more it's not so much you're all the way on this side or all the way on this side <laughs> i'm just saying there are more instances of you know one side or the other compared to the population at large yeah i can definitely see why that is and then one theory that I have, and I know this is just one factor in this, but I think one part of that, at least for people who are hyper or hyposexual, is the sensory experience, the sensory sensitivity. There's some cases where, um, you know, for instance, having a very sensitive sense of touch can be can make sex pretty much ten times more awesome. In some cases, it can make it ten times worse and sometimes painful for some. Um, so that that could be part of it, but it could also be related to, I don't know, just your natural development. It could be... Um, I also think, uh, and this is something that I hate to bring up, but I probably should, is people on the autism spectrum, they are more likely to be sexually exploited in some way or abused by somebody. Um, just because of the nature of how we are and not really 
maybe not being able to detect dangerous people as easily as others. So that can also have a drastic effect on sexuality and how we develop in that way. One thing that I definitely think can be a barrier to a, like an Aspie having a good sex life is probably the social social barriers, the communication issues with other people. Um, because in order to have a healthy romantic relationship in general, whether you, you know, have sex or not, you have to have good communication and, and that's very important. Like the more, it's like the more intimate the situation, the more you need to be able to communicate, pretty much. So, I hope that helps somewhat. So, uh, it's kind of an awkward topic, but it is definitely something people are curious about, which is okay. <laughs> Aspies have a tendency to be brutally honest, too. Um, in a romantic relationship, I'm sorry, but you kind of need to be, you need to be honest, but with sensitivity. So if, um, you know, it's kind of like, you know, if your wife asks you, does this dress make me look fat? You know, um, what you've probably been raised to know from most neurotypicals is don't tell them it makes them look fat. Say, oh, you look pretty, or oh, it looks okay. Like. If you can word it in a way that won't upset the other person, rather than blunt honesty, that's definitely something that helps a lot. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use that though to avoid, you know, conflicts that need to be honestly talked about. It's just when you do talk about things where you know someone's going to be upset, just approach it with caution and think about how you word it. Like, how would you take it if it was worded the way you want to word it before you actually say it? So thank you guys for all of your questions and comments, and I hope that our responses were helpful. I hope that you could understand what we were talking about. Um, and if there's anything that we didn't cover, any more questions you have, you can leave them in the comments of this video, or you can send me a personal message on Facebook. Either is good. And I hope you have a great Valentine's Day. Oh, and here's a Valentine for you. Bye. Wave goodbye.